So today we're going to talk about bevel up and bevel down planes. And I say, what's the deal? You know, let's get this straight. There's been, uh, you know, some confusion about the difference between bevel up and bevel down planes. And and I've had people ask me what, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy a plane. Should I buy a bevel up or a bevel down plane? And I say, yes, you know, buy one of each. Uh, there's a big difference between bevel up and bevel down and what they do for you. And it's basically how they work. Um, an example is, is, uh, is a chisel. If you folks can see this bench chisel. All right, when we use a chisel on wood, if we have the bevel up like this, we can lay that chisel way down and shear real close to the grain. If we have the bevel down like this and we're raising it up, we do tend to do more of a scraping action. When we get it down to the bevel, laying it on the bevel, we're literally getting under that grain, picking it up and shearing it off. And so if we wanna do a real shear action, of course, we're going to lay the plane down so it's bevel up. That's basically what we have in our low angle planes is that they are bevel up planes. So here's a front view of a couple of bevel up planes. Um, they are both essentially the same. You would probably call them a number four uh, smoother. Uh, the, the bevel up I've got there is uh, kind of in between. It's about a four and a half, I guess. It's a little bit wider. These are both um, Lee Valley Veritas planes. And I just use modern planes for this because that's where we find our bevel up planes and compare them to a bevel down plane, which is in the back. And again, it's where the bevel of the blade is, where the cutting action is, is the difference between the bevel up and the bevel down. And I think one of the biggest differences physically between these planes is the fact that a bevel up plane doesn't have a frog in here. This is the bevel down plane and it has the frog, very much like a, a Bailey plane. There's some differences where your lateral adjuster is and they have an, an adjustable frog, which is really a pretty cool thing. You can adjust the uh, throat by moving the, the frog back and forth and it moves the whole sole of the plane fore and aft. So you can close that throat down pretty much like you can do on a bevel up plane by moving the uh, toe very quickly, very easily. You can do it on a regular Stanley plane too, but this you can do much more quickly. But here's the difference. Bevel up, blade is down in the body of the plane. And let's jump down here, take it apart, and you can see very easily that there is a lateral adjuster here, and your lateral adjuster is up here, and the plane is held differently. Fewer parts in a, in a bevel up plane. We'll get a little closer here. This is your lateral adjuster in your bevel up plane, and the blade sits right in the body of the plane just like a block plane. And we'll we'll look at block planes towards the end of this seminar, where with a bevel down plane, we have the cutter or blade. We have a chip breaker. We have a lever cap, although in this case, <clears throat> it doesn't have a lever anymore. It's just got a thumb screw here that gives it tension. <clears throat> Your lateral adjuster moves the blade back and forth. Now, on a Lee Valley plane, the lateral adjuster is on top of the frog on top of the knob or the tote. And uh, that's okay. I still prefer the old Bailey planes, mainly because, you know, force of habit. I'm used to having the lateral adjuster right where my index finger is so that I can quickly, between my thumb and my index finger, I can move that lateral adjuster back and forth very quickly, uh, compensating for irregularities in the board and, and keeping my cutting action so that the shavings are coming out of the center of the throat of the plane. The lateral adjuster on a bevel up plane is buried down in the bottom of the plane because there is no frog and the blade is set right into the body of the plane. The only way they can have a, lever, a lateral adjuster is to bury it down underneath the blade. So it's down in the bottom of the plane. I find it somewhat uncomfortable to get to. And, and I use my lateral adjuster a lot. I'm, I'm constantly fine tuning it to make sure that the shavings are coming out of the center of the throat. That way I don't get the plow marks down the board. I can get my board a lot flatter, a lot quicker uh, by really paying attention to where that is. <clears throat> Again, 
I'm used to it now. I've used these uh, bevel up planes long enough that I know how to, you know, set my hands so that I can get at the lateral adjuster easier, but it's still not a comfortable thing for me. It's, it's uh, a little bit of a uh, little bit of an annoyance, but the cutting action of the plane is what really makes the difference. And that's, I can put up with it for the cutting action of the plane. And again, the difference between them is, is a, a bevel down plane. You're cutting at about 45, or you're cutting exactly at 45 degrees if you've got your plane sharpened without a back bevel. And that's as much of a scraping action as it is a cutting action. You're basically lifting the fibers up, you're scraping them loose and cutting them off. Uh, where a bevel up plane, when you've got that blade way down and the bevel up, it does more of a shearing action. It's like a knife. It cuts through uh, the wood. It has good parts and bad parts. The, the good part is that a bevel up plane, like a low angle block plane or a low angle bench plane, it is really good at doing very difficult grain, light cuts. It's really important to do light cuts. But because of that knife blade action or that, that shear cutting action, it will actually cut those tubes of the end grain. And that's when we get swirled grain and like white oak or in cherry. And that's basically what we have is we have end grain coming up to the surface. We have all these tubes that if you have a high angle plane and you hit those tubes, it tends to collapse them. And then once they've collapsed, they don't cut cleanly. The plane keeps going through them and it breaks them off. So we get tear out when we're trying to deal with things like end grain and swirled grain with a standard bevel down plane because of that high cutting angle. Now, the low cutting angle of a bevel up plane or a low angle plane, it gets in there like a knife and it shears those tubes off. Instead of compressing them and crushing them and tearing them out, it shears them off. But the drawback is, is that in straight grain, normal grain, it tends to want to get down underneath some of that grain and lift it up. So you can get egregious cutting. It can dig in real quick and you can get tear out that way. So a bevel up plane is best used for finish cuts and cuts in, in delicate wood or, or complex wood. If you have something that has road grain where the grain's going in opposite directions, something like sapile, uh, some of the mahoganies, the African mahoganies, they have road grain really hard to hand plane. A bevel up plane is the way to go, or a low angle, I guess, would be the easier way to call it. A low angle plane is really the ticket because it will shear that grain off. But you have to remember, there are two things that are really important about a bevel up plane. One, it needs to be sharp, very sharp all the time. You're going to spend more time honing and sharpening that blade than you would on a bevel down plane, but the results are going to be amazing because of that sheer cut, they do a really beautiful job. That's the reason that you want a couple different planes. Now we're going to talk about the fact that with a bevel up plane, you can have all of the different angles that you want, but um, we'll get to that in just a minute. But this is again, this is the basics between a bevel up plane and a bevel down plane. A few more parts with the bevel down plane, a few less parts with the bevel up plane. And again, the, the frog on a bevel down plane moves fore and aft to give you your throat. And let's get up here. And on a bevel up plane or low angle plane, the toe of the plane moves back and forth to open or close your throat for finer or coarser cuts. Now, I don't open the throat very far on my bevel up planes simply because I don't take coarse cuts with a bevel up plane. You get too much tear out because of that low angle. Now you can put a blade that's sharpened at a different angle in a bevel up plane and get back up to that 45 degree angle. Now there you could open up the throat to take aggressive shavings and it would work just fine. Uh, but I have bevel down planes that I use for my rough work. I'd much rather use a uh, regular bevel down number five or number six to rough out a board than I would a bevel up plane uh, simply because the lateral adjuster the way it works and what I'm used to. So uh, the toe of the plane, the adjustable toe plate does have a stop on it, 
which is really important. Uh, the old black planes, the bevel up black planes that I have, they have a little uh, cam on the front pivots. It's got a, a, a an elliptical hole in it. And you move that back and forth to open or close the uh, throat to move that toe fore and aft. And the thing is kind of always in the way. So it's one of the first things I do with the block plane uh, when I get it is take that adjuster out, get it out of there. The drawback with that is if I bump that toe up against some work or a bench or something like that when I'm working with, it can close that throat up. And if you hit it hard enough, it could actually damage your blade. So now uh, Lee Valley uh, has a an adjustable stop in there that will keep that from closing. And it's just, just all it is is a screw that's in there that you can adjust to hold that toe tight. So if you run up against something, it's not going to slam it shut up against your blade. And that's really nice. That's that's a real benefit to be able to have that. Now, this is the bevel down plane, and this is particularly unique with Lee Valley. With a regular Bailey plane, you can close the throat down by moving the frog forward. You have a couple of screws that you loosen. Uh, on a 604, you have a couple screws you can loosen. You can move the throat forward. On a regular Bailey plane, you take the blade and the cutter assembly out, and then you can move the frog forward to close down the throat for fine cuts. Well, somebody, uh, the engineer who designs most of the planes for Lee Valley, came up with this really great idea of having a shoe in the bottom of the plane where you loosen the thumb screw, you can move that uh, frog forward and close down the throat of the plane for fine cuts. And your blade is completely supported. One of the problems with the old Bailey planes is as you move that frog further and further forward for a smaller throat, you lose a little bit of the support of the frog or of the blade. Here you have complete support all the way down. You don't have to mess with anything other than just moving the frog forward. Sort of like a, a bedrock plane in a way, only this moves the sole along with the frog and moves it very easily. So I like that. I, I like innovation on stuff like this. You know, the uh, bench plane, the Bailey style bench plane has been around for, oh, geez, 150 years. And it's nice to see some innovation on it. Okay, I'm just going to segue for just a little bit on uh, something that we can do with a bevel up plane that we can't do with the bevel down plane. <clears throat> we can put a toothed blade in it. Now, these were originally designed for working with veneer because years ago, when you would veneer a piece, it was usually on solid wood and you'd hand plane that piece and it would be just a very, very slick smooth surface from hand planing it. And when you were going to hammer veneer, it would be almost too slick. Uh, it was nice to have a little traction. So they had a toothing plane that you would use over the surface to just very slightly roughen that surface, give it some little grooves so that it was easy to hammer veneer or veneer uh, a surface with hide glue. Uh, my understanding of the whole theory though. Uh, but what people have been finding out is that with a bevel up plane and a toothing uh, blade like this is that you can get into really gnarly wood. Just, you know, some of that crazy switchback grain stuff, things that just really has some weird grain. And taking light passes, you can flatten those areas out, cleave them and, and, and uh, clean them up a lot easier than you can with a regular blade, simply because you have less surface area that you're working with. Keeping them sharp, setting them up works really nice for cleaning up difficult woods. Okay, here's block planes, pretty much the same thing. You've got um, the bevel up versus bevel down. They're basically the same, or excuse me, they're all bevel up, but you've got two different angles. You've got the low angle and you've got the standard angle. Again, adjustable toe on the block planes. Uh, they don't have the stop. But now we're going to get into the real gist of what makes these planes better. Okay, this is our standard bevel down plane. And as you can see on the blade, there's the bevel. The bevel is down towards the bottom of the plane. 
<clears throat> you've got the back of the blade up here. This is where your chip breaker is and your uh, lever cap. And you've got a 45 degree angle. You basically sharpen your blade to 25 degrees. It's uh, sitting on a 20 degree bed and that gives you a 45 degree plane angle. That's what we cut at. And that is, to me, I kind of get a kick out of all the discussion that's been around for years about what bevel do you sharpen your blades for, for a standard bench plane. I've got a good friend who says, man, if you're working with white oak, you got to you got to sharpen them at 28 degrees. Got to be 28 degrees. It just works really well at 28 degrees. And uh, I kind of chuckle and I say, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, it makes huge difference, huge difference, huge difference. No, it makes no difference because we are cutting that wood at 45 degrees. That's what our bench plane is set up for. Now, if we were to back bevel the blade, putting a bevel back here, then we can change that cutting angle. But that's the only way. Otherwise, what we do back here, whether it's 25 or 28 or whatever degrees it is, uh, that is our relief angle. So we're cutting at 45 degrees. That's what we're cutting at. When the wood gets back to here, where the relief angle is, it's already cut. That wood is gone. So this relief angle really has nothing to do with it. We have a relief angle on the back just to uh, help the wood, what should we say? Help the blade clear the wood. I guess that's the way you'd put it. But if we change the angle on the back, then we can make a difference in our cutting angle. But that is kind of spooky because if you don't like the angle that you back bevel the blade to, the only way you get rid of it is to cut that much of the blade away until you get back to your 25 degree angle. So now you're cutting at 45 degrees. That's where the beauty of the bevel up planes come, is that now the bevel's on the top. It's got a 12 degree bed. That's where the blade sits in is a 12 degree bed. And so whatever angle you sharpen this blade at plus 12 degrees ends up your cutting angle. So what we've got here is this blade is sharpened at 39 degrees. It's one of the standard blades you can get from uh, Lee Valley. <clears throat> and with a 12 degree bed, that's a 50 degree cutting angle. And that's basically what a York angle uh, Bailey plane is, is the York angle was a 50 degree angle. But to get that on a Bailey plane, you either had to back bevel, which years ago they really didn't do, they switched out the frog with a frog that was five degrees higher so that you ended up with that 50 degree angle. They had a couple other frogs that were available and I don't recall the names of them. No, they, one of them was like a half angle or some weird name like that, that you could get all the way up to a 60 degree angle on a Bailey plane using your standard blade. Now, a 60 degree angle, that's, that's, tough going with a plane. I mean, you're going to really work your butt off getting that plane to cut because as you go up to that 60 degree angle, you're getting higher and higher and you're getting more of a scraping action. Uh, it scrapes as much as it does cut. <clears throat> Where would you use a 60 degree angle? With really difficult to plane woods. Plane woods that have a lot of uh, switchback grain or, or knots or swirls in them <clears throat> because when it's sharp and you're at that high angle, Again, it scrapes as much as it does cut. It's tough on the on that cutting edge. The cutting edge uh, degrades quickly, so you're going to be sharpening more frequently. You're going to be honing a lot. I when I was when I talk about sharpening, I talk about doing major work on a blade. Uh, honing is what I use to keep my blade sharp. I hone frequently. I use a guide for it so that I can replicate that angle. Uh, but I hone very frequently, I sharpen infrequently. Sharpening is usually because I have dinged the blade, I hit some anomaly in the wood and I took a little nick out of the blade. Then I'm going to sharpen back to where I've got a nice straight edge again, and then I'll hone it. And when you're constantly honing, you keep refining that edge, you keep polishing that edge and you get just a beautiful sharp edge. But I, 
I digress there a little bit. <clears throat> when you're using a really high angle like that, the scraping will take that edge down quickly. So if you've got a 39 degree bevel, you end up with a 50 degree cutting angle, or say you've got a 50 degree bevel on that and 12, you got a 62 degree cutting angle. You're going to be honing more, but you can work on some of these really difficult woods and have success because it will scrape and cut at the same time. But that's one of the beauties of the bevel up plane is that if you sharpen your blade at a standard 25 degree angle with that 12 degree bed, you've got a 37 degree cutting angle. You have a low angle plane. You could go below that 25 degrees and have it um, even a little bit steeper angle. Uh, you're going to have a fairly fragile edge when you get down to a really small knife edge like that. But for fussy things, you could quite easily change your angle. So whatever you sharpen your blade, you add 12 degrees to it, and that's your actual cutting angle. So if you could only have one plane in your shop, a bevel up plane would be the way to go because you could have multiple blades for it that are sharpened at different bevels so that you can have these different cutting angles for difficult wood and um, uh, end grain. Uh, these planes at, at a 37 degree angle, you're cutting very efficiently on end grain. Uh, it will shear those tubes off and leave a really nice, clean, smooth surface. And that's one of the tricks to end grain is to cut it, uh, sanding end grain, eh, it works okay, but it's not great simply because, again, we tend to, you know, end grain is just all the, the tubes, all the capillary uh, or the um, functionality of the, of the tree is going up through that board. And when you shear it off, you have all this end grain. And when you're sanding it, it tends to crush that end grain over so you don't get a really clean look. Uh, with a bevel down plane and that high angle, again, you're crushing those tubes, tearing them out, and you really can't get a clean look. That's why a lot of people, if they try to plane end grain, they crush it and they get some tear out. So then they resort to sanding and they sand finer and finer grits until they can get a fairly clean look. But if you take a bevel up plane and shear it, it's clean as a whistle right off the bat. You can take a look at it and you can see all of those tubes. Dean, do you adjust for a micro bevel on an up bevel plane? Do I adjust uh, on a bevel up plane? Do I adjust for a micro bevel? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, on a, on, if you're talking about doing a secondary bevel, I don't do secondary bevels on any of my planes per se. Uh, there, there are some bench planes where I have a secondary bevel on them simply because I use those planes for rough work, like my number six and my number five. Yeah, the secondary bevel, yeah. Uh, on my bevel down planes, uh, my five and six, I do a secondary bevel on it simply because I'm doing rough work with those planes most of the time. And that edge <clears throat> takes a beating and I'll get little nicks in it and, and beat it up. And uh, what a secondary bevel does is it just gives you a really narrow area that you're sharpening on. So you can sharpen the blade quickly with that narrow area. With all of my other planes, my smoothing planes, my shoulder planes, everything, everything is the bevel that I'm cutting at. Uh, I keep it very refined. Now, a bevel up plane, you absolutely don't want a secondary bevel because that is your cutting angle. So you want that blade to be at your cutting angle. I mean, you could put a secondary bevel on it, but uh, you you would have to know exactly what that secondary bevel is to get your included cutting angle. So um, secondary bevels are just, as far as I'm concerned, their only real purpose in the world is to make it quicker to sharpen because you're sharpening a very small area compared to the whole face of a blade. But I use a guide. I use Lee Valley's Mark II guide. Uh, Lee Nielsen has a very accurate guide. Uh, there's there's some really good guides out there. I use a guide all the time, especially when I'm honing, because I do hone the entire face of that blade. Uh, 
So I want to make sure I'm very, very accurate. And uh, I just, you know, every time I sharpen, I polish it a little more. I get rid of a few of the lines that may have been left over from more aggressive sharpening earlier on. So, so yeah, I guess your, your question is I don't use secondary bevels uh, other than just on my rough work planes because the, the only advantage I see is it makes it easier to sharpen. But this cutting angle is, is really important. Real low cutting angle, really great for shearing grain. High angle, really good for scraping. Uh, I've got a little plane up in the back here. You might see it way over there in the corner. It's a pole plane. It's a, a, a Taiwanese plane it's where the, it came from. And it, uh, um, I guess I could say Southeast Asian plane. It's a pole plane and it is, its blade is at a 70 degree included angle. So that thing is a little beast to use because it's really scraping more than it's planing basically. But if I run into, you know, I take very fine shavings with it. If I run into a real difficult patch, say I've got a piece of white oak that has that nice swirled grain that makes white oak interesting, uh, basically almost like little knots coming up to the surface, uh, those are really hard to plane cleanly. It seems like no matter which direction you come at them, uh, no matter how sharp your bevel up plane is, they still like to tear out a little bit. But that high angle bevel down plane, uh, and that's what it is, it's a, it's a bevel down when you're at the 70 degree angle. It's a, it's a unique design. It will scrape those clean faster than a card scraper. A lot of times if I'm having trouble with difficult grain, uh, I'll get the board as flat and as clean as I can, and then I'll jump on my card scrapers and I'll finish it up with a card scraper. But sometimes you get too much tear out to effectively use a card scraper. You're going to be there for a while to get rid of it. So if I've got some really uh, gnarly, ugly grain, I'll take that real high angle plane and very carefully, very lightly plane it until I've got it flat and relatively cleaned up. And then I'll come back in with my card scraper and I'll finish scraping the surface to get it clean. And, uh, you know, it's always this combination of things that we use. Um, uh, can you please show us your honing guide? Yeah, I think I can get out one of my honing guides here. I have my sharpening equipment close by, which is handy. This is my Lee Valley Mark II honing guide. It's got a roller on the bottom that rolls on your surface. It's got a clamp here that holds the blade in place. And it's got a setup guide that you slide on the piece. You slide it on here. You set this up. You run your uh, sharp edge in through the bottom until it hits the stop on this guide right here. There's a stop. Slide it in. Once it has hit that, you can remove the guide. You've got your blade set up at an angle. You can go ahead and start sharpening. But this is the the Lee Valley Mark II honing guide. And uh, they, they work amazingly well. You can get consistent bevels. I got my first Mark II, oh, gee, when they first came out, that must be 15 years ago, something like that. Um, the magazine. Fine Woodworking <clears throat> sent me one, and um, um, I tried it out and was pretty amazed because I was really a, a doubting Thomas when it came to guides. I, I had some of the little ones that were what was available, a single wheel in the middle, and uh, I didn't find them to be very accurate. Uh, and this thing is just right on the money. <clears throat> Uh, Edwin asks, uh, with the long roller, how do you camber your blade? Do you try to camber the blade a bit? Most of my blades are not cambered. I keep them straight all the way across. One of the reasons for cambering is so that you lift the corners of the blade up just very slightly so you don't put the, the plow lines in the surface uh, quite as readily. I'm just really careful to make sure that I have my shavings coming out of the center of the throat of the plane, and that keeps those corners from cutting in. Uh, I get little lines when I'm done with my, my planing. There will be real faint lines. But if I keep those corners absolutely sharp, they're clean cut. There's no tear out. I come in with my card scraper, 
one or two passes and those are all gone. I like a flat blade because I end up with a flat surface. If you camber it, you end up with a convoluted surface. Now when you go in with your card scraper, you're going to be scraping all of that out. Now, um, I'm just I'm, I'm glancing over here. Hello, Mitchell. Good to good to hear from you. Uh, he says, uh, can you mention pull direction for a Mark II guide when you use it? Yeah, the the again, I'll grab the guide here. I should probably put a blade in it. Um, oh, that's the center guide. Let's just. Uh, We'll just very quickly throw a chisel in here. <laughs> Nothing like watching me fool around here and fumble around until I get things set up. Okay, we'll pretend that this is set in here accurately. Here's a chisel, and here I've got my bevel down on the surface, and what I've seen a lot of people and the people from Lee Valley do this when they're utilizing this jig, they've got their hands up on top of the jig and they're running it back and forth on the surface. Well, I do mine just the opposite. I turn it around, I grab the jig on top and I put my thumbs, hard to show here, but I put my thumbs on the blade and I push down on the blade and push it away from me. What that does is I can put more pressure right on the blade, right down on my my honing or my uh, cutting surface and I have less pressure up here on the jig so I'm not as likely to skew that blade around and uh, giving myself an odd bevel and it works so much faster because you can put um, pressure on it. Now Dean has a note here he said uh, uh, he said that uh, um, Lee Valley does make a blade or a uh, roller here for putting a uh, uh, camber on the wheel. It's a barrel shaped roller. And so you can uh, put a camber on your blade if you'd like. Um, Mike Pekovich, uh, friend of mine and uh, the head of our magazine these days, Fine Wood Rigging Magazine. Mike just puts, he likes just a couple thousandths of an inch camber. He just puts a little pressure on each side when he's sharpening it. And uh, you can do that even with a wide roller. Uh, you can get a little bit of camber. But again, I typically don't use camber uh, for flattening the board. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Stephen, I set up the honing guide using a magnetic level on the blade. Yeah, the, uh, the digital inclinometers that we have these days are great for setting up a very, very accurate um, angle. I don't find that I need to use it with the, the Mark IIs, the Lee Valley. They're uh, very accurate right off the bat, if you're careful setting them up. But that really is a good way to absolutely get uh, an angle. I, I use uh, the, the uh, digital inclinometers for uh, all my other setup for setting your tilt on your table saw. I don't even look at the uh, the uh, uh, the tilt anymore. I set it all with a digital inclinometer because it's absolutely accurate all the time. Um, back to having camber on the blade. Now, there are a couple of, I've got a couple of smoothers. I've got one in particular back here that I do have camber on the blade. And I have the camber on the blade for decorative purposes. Um, it can be handy sometimes if you're dealing with some fussy wood that's just perplexing you because when you put camber on the on the blade, basically what you're doing is you're narrowing down the width of cut. So if you've got a two inch blade on there and you put just a little bit of camber on, now you've got an inch and a half wide blade because you've gotten rid of a quarter of an inch on each side. If you put more aggressive camber on, now you got a one inch wide cutting surface makes it easier to cut you know people say oh with camber on it's easier to cut that's why i do it well yeah but i want more than a one inch wide blade that just takes too long to flatten a surface out if you have a one inch or one and a quarter inch wide blade i want to use the whole width of that blade when i get down to the fine shavings or when i'm doing rough work i want the whole width will it leave some tracks 
Sure, well, when you're doing rough work, of course, well, but you don't care because the rough work is to get it flat. Once you've got it flat, now you're going to go in with a smoothing plane and you're going to smooth it off. Uh, six plane, uh, 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 number six is usually the first plane to use on rough wood. That's why they call it a four plane, F O R E plane, because it's the first plane you're going to use. And it's a good old bevel down plane. You're cutting at a 45 degree angle. Keep it sharp and just get in there and hog the wood away. You're going to move your chip breaker back on the blade a little bit so you can take a bigger shaving. You're going to open the throat up so that you can take a bigger shaving and you just get in there and get to work. And if you get a little bit of tear out here and you get some tracks and grooves, not a big deal. You're just getting the wood flat. Once you have it flat, then you'll jump to a number five or a number four or a number three. You know, if you want an narrower plane, use number three or number two. Um, and away you go. Uh, Yale asks, which uh, digital inclinometer do I suggest? Um, I use uh, Wixie. I've had really good luck with Wixie, and, uh, and that's what I use. Uh, Greg, do you ever use a scrub plane? Yes, I do. I've got a scrub plane right here. And uh, there are a lot of people who poo-poo a, a scrub plane, but I find that it is, uh, it's a wonderful plane because it's got um, a really stout, heavy blade. It doesn't chatter at all. You can really get in there and knock some wood down. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of what a scrub plane is, very narrow. It's uh, this is about what an inch and a half, I suppose, width blade. Uh, it's got an aggressive camber on it, very, very pronounced camber on it. Uh, there's no frog in this, it's just bedded into a chunk of iron, uh, wedged into place. And uh, these things are a um, very, um, what should we say, non specific plane. Now, I use them for. Uh, I use them for a lot of different purposes, mostly for just roughing wood down. You know, you get a, a wide board that's that's um, too wide for the joiner, and it's got some twist in it, or maybe even if it is, uh, will fit on the joiner. It's got some fairly aggressive twist, or it's got some big humps in it, and you don't want to be passing that over the joiner over and over again. So I'll lay straight edges on it, see where the worst the humps are. I'll circle them so I know what I'm taking off scrub it with my pencil so I know where I'm working and I'll grab that scrub plane and I'll just knock that off and I, I'm going to get some tear out it's not going to be pretty it'll be quick and efficient and then once I get that knocked down then I'll take a number six and come in and clean it up and that's one of the things you can do with a regular plane is you can put an aggressive radius on there and you really use it almost like a scrub plane uh what is the angle of the scrub plane blade? Uh, 25 degrees. And uh, and the uh, the camber, whatever you want. They're non-specific plane. Uh, I kind of follow the what the uh, original curve was. And that leads to another thing about putting a camber on a blade is that it is not as easy or quick to hone because now you've got a camber on it and it's not specific. We can't mirror that camber perfectly every time we go to hone it. If you have a straight, sharp edge with crisp, clean corners, well, that's real easy to hone because you put it in your guide, you put it on your honing stone or your, like I, I use sandpaper on granite. I've got my whole sharpening system right behind me here. And I can hone that very, very quickly and get that wire edge, knock the wire edge off and boom, I'm back planing. So I always know where I'm at. It's very specific. But like I say, I have a smoother that has camber on it, and I use it for decorative purposes. I'll flatten out a board. I'll get it really clean. I'll right down to card scraping it. It is essentially ready to be finished. I take that plane that has the cambered blade. I set it for a nice fine cut, and then I go over that surface to give it that undulation of a quote-unquote hand-planed look because it is it, it looks nice people love that look i mean if you were in a cabinet shop 150 years ago or 200 years ago uh the uh boss of the cabinet shop the journeyman would probably clip you across the ears if you had a surface like that and said go back and clean that up i want it flat uh you look at good quality work from that era and all the all the surfaces that you can see are beautifully done. I mean, they're clean, they're flat. Now you look at drawers, especially drawer bottoms. Those are pretty humorous. You know, you pull out a drawer on a 
couple hundred year old piece, flip it over and look at the bottom. It's it looks like you know almost like somebody took an axe to clean up the bottom of it because they weren't going to put that much effort in something that you couldn't see. Uh, you know, structurally it was just fine. It it worked fine to have uh, the rough bottom in it, but it only took you a couple of minutes with a scrub plane or something similar to get that bottom flattened out. And the the other side probably looked the same when they got it down roughly to the dimension. And then they jumped over to smoothing planes to finish off the thickness and get it clean. So uh, scrub planes have been around a long time and they are, I find them very, very functional. Plus you can be an artist with a, <laughs> with a scrub plane. You can put some fairly aggressive grooves in it. And if you're doing something fairly rustic, a scrub plane can really give you an interesting surface. Uh, you're going to have tear out in it. It's not going to be a beautiful uh, uh, refined surface. You are going to have some tear out. But if you're looking for something fairly rustic, it can give you just a really beautiful texture. Um, question, Raquel, I have a scrub plane blade that I need to regrind. Someone told me to grind a camber. Um, yeah, the the camber seven inch circle, I've heard that um, said before is, is what it would be. I've never measured mine, but seven inch diameter circle, that would be a fairly aggressive um, camber on it. But again, you can, you know, if you don't like what you see, if it's too aggressive, you can, you can always regrind it and change it. And there again, basically, you've got a fairly narrow blade with a fairly aggressive camber on it. You end up only using maybe about three quarters of an inch of that blade. That's all that, that gets used in the wood. That's why it can remove, one of the reasons it can remove wood quickly is that you're not taking the full width of the blade you're not taking a huge amount of wood. So it allows you to work with uh, really difficult wood fairly aggressively and it won't kill you doing it. Um, it's, excuse me, it's uh, got a tickle on my nose. It's amazing how fast you can remove uh, very dense hardwoods very quickly with one of these planes. But I'll tell you what, you get to understand grain direction real quick with one of those planes because they uh, they can do egregious tear out if you go against the grain and uh, are really um, in full tilt uh, with pushing that plane through. You will get a lot of tear out, but uh, you can do that with uh, with a regular plane. Um, I've got a friend who uses number five, almost like a scrub plane. He's got a fairly aggressive camber on the blade. He keeps the throat wide open. And that's what he uses for roughing roughing boards down is his number five with an aggressive camber. And it's a bevel down plane. You know, it's sharpened at 25 degrees. It's cutting at 45. Uh, that's what a scrub plane cuts at is 45. And uh, it's ugly, nasty, but it gets the job done. And if you're looking for texture, if you're looking for uh, that look, uh, you can get it done. Years ago, uh, in my commercial shop, we had uh, a project where we were doing uh, um, dining room tables that uh, they wanted a rustic look to the dining room tables. These were out of pine. Uh, just uh, it wasn't uh, construction grade pine, but it wasn't select either. There were knots and swirls and stuff in it. And they wanted us to run it through the time saver with a real coarse grit sandpaper on it. And they were going to work colored wax in the surface to give it a rustic look. Well, we did one like that. And then we did one where we sanded it until it was flat and, and clean and then took a number five or a number four, I don't remember which, and put a, a good bevel or a good camber on the blade and then just hand planed the surface. And we paid attention to which way the grain ran but we weren't concerned about knots and stuff. When we went through the knots, you'd get tear out and chip out, but it worked fine. And it had a really interesting texture. And when the people who wanted these tables came and looked at it, they said, yeah, that's the one we want. They pointed at the hand plane. They didn't like the look of the sanded one at all. It looked ridiculous actually. But that's the kinds of things that you can do with a cambered plane, uh, more decorative than it is functional. Uh, function is, it, it saves you a little time setting up your blade. If you're going to do a camber, do a very, very slight one on a plane because you got to remember if you do a fairly aggressive camber 
on that smoothing plane, you're going to come back and either card scrape it or sand it, and you're going to have a convoluted surface. So it's going to take you a lot longer to flatten that surface out and get it the way you want. If you have a flat blade to begin with, you're going to be a lot better off. And a bevel up plane is an awful handy little devil to have around because of the fact that it, of its cutting action. Um, it can do end grain, it can do swirled grain, it can do all the ugly, nasty stuff. But again, you have to remember, you're gonna to have to keep it razor sharp. You're gonna be sharpening that thing a lot because of the way it cuts. It knife cuts the wood, it shears it off. So it needs to be like a chisel, like a bench chisel. You can't do a good job of shearing end grain if you're shearing off a plug and you have a chisel that's less than scary sharp you're going to have a tough time shearing that off because it wants to collapse the grain and tear it out if it's super sharp it crisply cuts that grain and allows you to get through that end grain without any problem and of course when you're doing something like that on a plug you could you could do it with a plane uh it'd be a little cumbersome because you're going to have really short strokes but you could do it the block plane works fine with it but you always cut towards the middle because if you cut towards the outside edge it will break that wood out because there's nothing supporting it, allowing it to cut cleanly. Same thing if you're going to plane an end grain board on a, say a, it's a, a table edge or a leaf for a table, um, you're going to have a, a dead head clamped up against the end. So that when you get to the end of that board, you're not going to tear that board out. You're gonna cut into that blowout board on the end and uh, and keep it from tearing out but there again if you do any of that end grain style work uh, a low angle plane is what you want and a low angle plane like this gives you a whole lot more uh, inertia than a block plane i mean you can do it with a block plane i used block planes for years for doing that i was always looking for a uh, stanley 162 that i could afford that was their um, or 182, I believe, 162, 62, I think, was their bevel up plane. But they were really hard to find, and they, they brought a big chunk of money. And uh, so when Lee Valley and Lee Nielsen came out with bevel up planes, full-size planes, I was thrilled because now I could get one for doing primarily end grain work. That's what I use those for, end grain work and real fussy work where I'm taking really fine shavings. But again, you have to keep them really sharp and you want to take light shavings. Now, camber on a bevel up plane, I've never messed with it before. I've always cut straight across. I suppose you could put camber on there to keep those corners up. But again, you're just narrowing the blade. Um, yeah, you're not going to have the little lines you get in the edge, but if your blade is sharp all the way out to the edge, those are clean lines. And if you're you know cutting so deep that you're leaving aggressive lines even using your lateral adjuster what that is is it's just a step from one cut to the next don't cut so much wood you know take finer cuts when you get down to the end uh, you know you can take a, a, a shaving of a thousandth of an inch um, if your blade's sharp uh, so you know just take those uh, uh, what does Roy call them the whisper something or other thin shavings um, and uh, uh, then if you have little lines there, they're so fine that you come in with your card scraper or your sander and they're gone just instantly. A uh, couple of tips when you're hand planing, a pencil is your best friend when you're hand planing as well as when you're sanding. You're going to take that pencil and you're gonna lay it on its side and you're gonna, you're gonna put pencil lines all over your work and you're gonna plane those pencil lines off. That way, even on real rough boards, you know, if I'm starting out with a rough sawn board that I'm going to hand plane, I knock the fuzz off so I can actually scribble on it. And then I scribble all over it. And uh, that gives me, shows me where my high and low spots are very quickly. And I'll also use winding sticks and straight edges to find my egregious lumps. And I'll circle those, knock those down quick. And then I'll get to planing the whole board and a pencil is just a heck of a good guide because you'll know exactly where you are. When you're card scraping or sanding, a pencil is exactly what you need because you card scrape those pencil lines off. People have always often asked me, you know, how do I know when I'm done card scraping? Well, 
when the pencil lines are all gone. You know that you've got that whole surface covered. And, and then of course a raking light really makes a big di big difference. But again, the big difference between bevel up and bevel down, bevel up, you've got a uh, 12 degree bed and your bevel on your blade gives you your cutting angle. A bevel down plane, you're at 45 degrees. And again, if you do a back angle and the back angle is cutting this backside here, if you cut that, say if you do a, a 10 degree cut on the back of it, well, yeah, you're raising that cutting angle and now you're going to have a higher angle. You can't do anything about getting a lower cutting angle. You can only raise it up. Uh, there are people who are fans of the ruler trick where you lay a ruler down, have it on the back side of the blade and you give a really tiny uh, micro bevel to the back. I don't do that. I, you know, I want my cut and my sharpening to be as absolutely straightforward and repeatable as possible. The ruler trick on the back side, what have you got for an angle? What what is it? Is it is it a little more on one side than the other? Uh, it can't be that super consistent. And all you're doing is you're changing the cutting angle a little bit. You're not getting it any sharper. One of the big things that you absolutely have to do when you're sharpening is to get the back side of that blade polished. And you want to polish it all the way out to the end. And when you polish it, you always want to make sure that when you have that blade sitting on your surface. You tip the blade up before you lift it off the surface. You don't drag it off because it's too easy to accidentally put a micro bevel on the back, an uncontrolled micro bevel. So, um, again, this is the big difference 45 degrees with bench planes, whatever you want with block planes within reason. Um, but uh, that gives you your, your different angles. And like I said before, if I could only have one plane in the shop, it would be a bevel up plane simply because I could have two or three different angles of blades to give me my different cutting. I could have 25 degree, my low angle. I could have a 50 degree giving me 62 degree bevel for high angle, for uh, difficult woods, for gnarly woods, stuff like that. And you could do it in one plane. You could have the high angle to rough a knot out. Say you've got a knot you're dealing with. You could take fine shavings at a high angle and scrape that knot as much as you are cutting the knot. Once you've got it flat and got all the anomalies out, now drop it down to a low angle. Take a couple nice fine light shavings to clean it off really nice and you're done. Uh, same plane, just different blades. So, so there, <laughs> in a nutshell, that's what we're looking at the difference between a bevel up and bevel down. So questions, people have questions about this. Anybody out there like to uh, try to stump me? <laughs> I'm stumped every day when I walk into my shop, so uh, it wouldn't be hard, but. Okay, I guess if we don't uh, let's see, Greg, the bevel up does not have a chip breaker. When you use that at 45 degree angle, does that have any effect? Um, not really. Uh, the chip breaker helps uh, bring the uh, shavings out of the throat a little more on a plane, uh, but you're not going to notice any real big difference. Um, they're going to functionally be about the same. Again, I really do prefer a bevel down for my general planing uh, just because of the way they work. They, the chip breaker may have something to do. Biggest, the biggest uh, asset of a chip breaker in a regular bevel down plane is your depth adjustment. The chip breaker is what moves the blade up and down. Uh, it does help move the shavings out, but that's kind of a secondary thing. Uh, Dennis, can you clarify the sharpening angle of each type? 20 to five degrees versus 30 degrees. Well, um, I sharpen all my blades at 25 degrees just because it's expedient and it works well. Uh, on a bevel down plane, that's just a clearance angle on the back side. It really doesn't mean anything as far as a cutting angle because on a bevel down, I am shearing the wood at 45 degrees. On a bevel up plane, if I sharpen it at 30 degrees, you have to add the bed angle in at 12 degrees. So now I have a 42 degree cutting angle, almost like a regular bench plane. If I have 25 degrees and add it to that 12 degrees, I have a 37 degree 
I've dropped it down five degrees and that can make a huge difference as far as the cutting action. So that's basically what you're looking at. On, on a bevel down plane or standard bench plane, that back angle is, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's not anything of any real consideration. 25 degrees is where uh, the Stanley bench planes ended up. Uh, that's what most of the manufacturers have for their standard angle is 25 degrees on a bench plane. It's worked fine forever because it is a relief angle at the back. It's not, it really doesn't have anything to do with your cutting angle. Here again, you know, you've got, this is a bevel down plane. You've got 45 degrees. That's what you're cutting at right here is 45 degrees. Right here, it means nothing because that wood is already cut. So this angle back here, as, as they say here, it's a relief angle. You know, it's just uh, um, really doesn't have a, a lot to do as far as I'm concerned with the cutting of the wood. Other questions? I hope that uh, that answered what you were asking about, Dennis. <laughs> 